Welcome to Beach, whether you're in the room or online. We're so excited to have you. My name is Ryan, and I'm the student pastor here at Beach, and it is, uh, it's November 1st, so Merry Christmas to everybody. Um, really excited for the Christmas season. Start putting up your lights. Start wearing your Santa Claus hats. Um, start listening to Christmas music. That's an important thing this time of year. Um, we're in a series called Flawed and Faithful where we look at the life of King David. And even if you are new to church and you've never heard of who King David is, you have heard of David most likely, um, but as a boy who killed a giant named Goliath. And um, the thing that David shows us that is so refreshing for us is that you can be human, which all of us are, you can be human and mess up and still be faithful to and follow after God. Um, being a Christian doesn't mean you have it all together. It doesn't mean you're perfect. And so whether you are a, a, a veteran Christian, you've been following Jesus for a long time, or you come here and you're like, I don't even believe in God. I'm just here for free lunch or to get my friend off my back. Um, or, or my friend sent me the link and I'm just kind of bored. And so I'm watching it online. Well, whatever it is, this message is for you. We can find hope and um, and really encouragement in the life of David because of how much he loved God, but because of also how imperfect he was. Have you ever found yourself saying the following statement? I can't help it. I can't help it. Maybe you, uh, you're on a diet and uh, you've been eating good for, I don't know, 48 hours or something, and then someone brings pizza over, and, and you're, you just finished your seventh piece of pizza, and you're like, ah, I, I got to tell you, man, I'm, I'm on a diet, but I just can't help it when it comes to pizza. Pizza's just my, it's my weakness. I, I, can't, I can't help it. I can't help it. Um, maybe you uh, go to bed at 3.30 in the morning because you've just watched 14 straight episodes of Ozark or some show on Netflix, and you're like, I mean, I meant to go to bed early, but uh, I, was, I was watching Netflix, and you know, it's just my weakness. I just can't, I can't help it. I, start, I see that little thing that starts going next episode, and the little bar's going. I'm like, I gotta, I gotta make a decision. Okay, I'll watch it for another hour, and I just stayed up forever. It's, it's crazy. Uh, maybe you're a, a grandparent. You've experienced this. Your, your child has told you, uh, your adult child, uh, the, the parent of the, the grandchildren has told you, hey, you know, we, we don't want a bunch of toys. Here's kind of a list of some things that our, our child needs. Can, can we not make it like a toy store? And then you, you look around on Christmas morning and there's just, it's just Toys R Us. There's, there's toys everywhere and, and it's, just, it's just a mess. And, and you're like, ah, they're my grandkids. I can't help it. I just can't help it. Um, sometimes we can't help stupid things that are just small, that are funny, that kind of thing. But when it comes to the deepest struggles of our lives, the deepest sins of our lives, the deepest temptations of our lives, we often find ourselves saying, I, I just can't, I can't help it. I can't help it. You blow up at your spouse or at your friend or at your children with anger and temper. And you're like, I'm sorry, honey, I'm sorry. I, I just can't help it. I just, ah, that's always been my problem, right? Like I, I just, ah, I struggle with the whole anger temper thing. And, and you know, you know, I don't mean anything about it. I just can't, I can't help it can't help it. Maybe you uh, have an addiction, um, maybe to a substance, or maybe, uh, maybe it's, a, it's a pornography addiction, whatever, whatever addiction you have, and you find yourself giving into that temptation and, and saying, ah, I just can't help it. I've always struggled with it. You know, my, my, my dad's dad was, a, was an alcoholic. My, my, my uncle's an alcoholic. It's just, it's genetic. It's in the family. I just can't do anything about it. It's stronger than me. I can't help it. Maybe you struggle with gossip or kind of putting your foot in your mouth and saying the things that you didn't think you were going to say or you didn't want to say and you're just constantly doing it and, and you do it again and someone gets mad at you and you've got a friend that's mad at you and, and, they're, and they're yelling at you, come on, come on, why did you do that again? You told something I didn't want you to tell, you said something that hurt me and you say, oh, you know, we all have weaknesses, this is just mine, I can't help it. I've always, I've always struggled with this. Often we find ourselves saying, I can't help it. And let me tell you something, this is one of the greatest lies that Satan will tell you. He will tell you, you're not good enough. You can't help it. You can't fix it. You'll never get past it. You'll always struggle with it. No group meeting's gonna help you. No medicine's gonna help you. No prayer's gonna help you. No accountability's gonna help you. You're going to never get past this. It's just not gonna happen. You can't help it. You can't help it. I wanna look at, before we go to David, I wanna look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. This is written by Paul, the missionary, the pastor, to people who are, who are trying to follow after Jesus. And here's what he says. He says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, meaning the, the, the normal temptations that all people struggle with. 
No temptation has overtaken you that is, that is unique or different than someone else in history. Sometimes we like to say that. We're like, well, no one else has ever gone through this. Well, y- yes, they have. Someone else has gone through that temptation, that struggle. He continues. He says, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Now, a lot of well-meaning Christians have taken this way out of context. It's one of those things that we say to people. Um, you know, someone loses their spouse or loses their child or is in the worst day of their life. They, they lose their business. They're in financial ruin. And they come up to you and they, they're trying to be nice. But they say, you know, God will never give you more than you can handle. And you're like, thanks, but I'm going to punch you in the face because that doesn't help anything. Like, I'm, I, I, I can't handle this. I can't handle what's going on. This is too much. God's promise is that he will be with you through it. He doesn't say there are things that you can't handle. There are lots of things we can't handle. That's why we need God's presence. That's why we have the promise of his presence in our lives, that we will turn to him. We can turn to him, and he will always be there with us. No, this verse is talking about temptation. It's not talking about difficult situations. It's talking specifically about temptation, sin, struggles. Paul says, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Meaning, you can get out of it. He says, when you are tempted, he will provide a way out. Everybody say, a way out. If you're in the chat, type out, a way out, so that you can endure it. But here's what I know about me. Here's what I know about humanity. When it comes to our struggles, our sins, often we look for the way in, don't we? Like, Afterwards, we get upset that we did it. But before, we're kind of looking for that way that we can still satisfy that desire, satisfy that temptation. It doesn't matter if there's a big neon sign over the the, the way out. We want to go to the way in. We want to figure out how we can get what we want. But God promises there is a way out. There is no temptation that will overtake you completely. There is nothing too powerful for you with God's power. What Paul is saying here is, you can help it. Look at somebody you came here with, keeping your mask on, not spitting in their face. Say, you can help it to somebody next to you. You can help it. If you're in the chat, type out, you can help it. The lie is, I can't help it. The truth is, you can help it. God has promised that you can help it if you are willing to do what he says. If you are willing to do what he says. Now, some of the stuff in this sermon might might seem a little bit self-helpy. Like, you're going to listen to this and be like, Oh, that's like, that's not really talking about Jesus. That's not really talking about God. It's just, it's just like steps to be a better person. It's not. This is not self-help because we are going to God's word for his help. And so just because we do it, when we're applying God's wisdom, that is not self-help. That is God's help. That is us going to God because we don't know what we're doing. We don't know how to fix it, but he has provided a way out. He has said that you can help it through his word. And so as we go through this, I want you to keep in mind that this is God speaking to us about temptation, about sin, about struggles. And so we're going to turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 11, the darkest moment of David's life, the worst sin he ever commits, the worst situation he ever puts himself in. And as we read this, we are going to see a process, a process, a process of sin, temptation, and struggle. Sin never happens all at once. It may feel that way. I just got, oh, I can't believe, I can't believe I did that. No, no, no. It never happens all at once. The worst day of your life, it never happens all at once. That, 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 that habit, that addiction, it never happens all at once. It's a process. It's a process. Everybody say that together. It's a process. It's a process. It's a process. We're going to see the process of sin, temptation, and struggles. In David's life here. And we're going to look at specifically the first four verses. Because each of them has a point for us to take. And they're not in any particular order of importance. These are just all things that we find ourselves maybe doing when we're on the wrong road. When we're on a road to sin, struggle, and temptation. All right. So, starting in verse 1. In the spring. In the spring. At the time when kings go off to war. This is like my favorite beginning of a Bible verse in the entire Bible. Like I I, I read it and I think about like like the Hobbit or Lord of the Rings or Chronicles of Narnia and one of those things and all the all the animals and the orcs and like the whatever they're all just getting ready in the knights and the centaurs and and they're they're all ready to fight. And it's it's they got their swords out and it's like they're going into battle in the springtime. I, I think of it like in a British accent. I can't do a British accent but I think of it in a British accent in the spring at the time when kings go off to war. David, King David, King David, 
King David, not, not any David, King, King David. So this applies to him. When kings go off to war, King David sent Joab, his general, out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remi- remained in Jerusalem. Let me cut out the middle part of this verse and read it to you again, just so we're clear on what's going on. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, King David remained in Jerusalem. Kings go off to war, but King David remains in Jerusalem. Now, let's backtrack just a little bit into chapter 10. In chapter 10, David and Israel are fighting against the Ammonites and the Aramaeans. And the Aramaeans regroup and they march out to fight Israel. And it says at the very end of chapter 10, when David was told of this, he gathered Israel and they crossed the Jordan. And the Aramaeans formed their battle lines to meet David and they fought against him, but they fled before Israel. And David killed 700 of their charioteers and 40,000 of their foot soldiers. They defeated them. David was doing what he was supposed to do. He was doing what kings did in ancient times. They didn't sit back behind a desk while everyone else went and fought. They went and they led their troops into battle. He was a warrior king. This is what he was supposed to do. And he had been doing it really, really well. But all of a sudden, a few months later, they're going to fight the same enemy. The same enemy. Nothing's changed. And yet, David stays home. David stays home. Here's the first thing we see. When it comes to sins and struggles, we get complacent. One of our warning steps is we get complacent. I mean, when David was just becoming king, he was going to be out at every battle. He was going to make sure he did what he was supposed to do. But, well, he got complacent. You know, I've, I've done a lot for this nation, David thought to himself. I'm going to enjoy a year off. I need a little load management. If you're an NBA fan, you get that. I need a little load management. I need the night off. I just need to, to chill this year. Oh, I've delegated well. My, my officers, they know what to do. Like, they'll handle it. I'm going to stay in my palace. I'm going to enjoy my kingship. He got complacent. He finds himself not doing what kings are supposed to do, not doing what he usually would do. You know you're getting complacent when you say things like, it's okay, it's fine, I don't need to fill in the blank. Or I, it's just fill in the blank. Like you used to have boundaries, but you get complacent. I'm doing well in that area. It's been, it's been months since I touched that, that sin since I gave in to that sin. I'm doing well. I'm good. I'm good. It's all good. I don't need to set a boundary. I can go there and be okay. I can hang out with that person. It's no problem. No big deal. Everything's going to be all right. When you start saying things like that, you might be in danger because you're getting complacent. You're starting to think, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. I don't need all the rules, all the structure, all the accountability. I'll be fine. We get complacent. Verse 2, David's complacent. He stays home. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. Nothing wrong with this, right? He's 50 years old. Gets up in the middle of the night. Nature calls. He's, he's going to the bathroom. He's walking around the roof of the palace. He's looking around. Man, this is great. Look at my great city. Look at this nation I've, 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 I've established. I'm a great king and... Um, yeah, this is nice. This is nice. Let me enjoy the, the spring air in Jerusalem. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. Nothing wrong with that. Not his fault. He lives at the highest point in the city. I don't know why her hygiene habits were that she would take showers in the middle of the night with no electricity um, on her roof. Why was she naked on her roof? It's just, just a strange way to take a shower or or to take a bath. I'm not sure what she's doing, but for some reason she's on the roof. That's not David's fault. It wasn't David's fault. He saw her. Same thing with temptation, right? Like you're not, you're not sinning when you're tempted. What do you do with the temptation? We see what David did. You may not notice it, but when we really think about what's going on, look at this next line. The woman was very beautiful. David, how do you know the woman's beautiful? You're 51 years old. In ancient Israel, you don't have glasses, you don't have contacts, you don't have binoculars. How do you know she's beautiful? It's dark. There's no electricity. How do you know? Because he stared. Because he focused. Because he watched. Because he let the temptation and the glance turn into a gaze. He watched. Here's the second thing that happens. When we're going down the wrong path, we focus on the wrong thing. He started to focus on her. He focused on the wrong thing. And here's the truth about focus. We always move towards what we focus on. 
If you're focused on money, you're gonna move towards money. If you're focused on a relationship, you're gonna move all in towards that relationship. If you're focused on getting fit, you're gonna move in towards getting fit. When you're driving down the interstate, when you're focused on a billboard, and then you're, you're just gonna start veering off to the side, you hit those rumble strips, and you're like scared to death, and, and you're like, oh, and you get back on the road and all that kind of stuff, because you, you move towards what you focus on. You move towards what you focus on. David gets focused on the wrong thing. The wrong thing. So David sends someone to find out about her. She's beautiful after all. He asks one of his servants, hey, hey, will you, will you, will you see what, who, who's that girl? Can you find out about her for me? And the man said, and keep this in mind, this is a servant of an ancient king. You didn't tell the kings what to do. You didn't tell the king, you didn't question the kings. You just did whatever they said. They might just cut off your head just because they wanted to and nobody would care about it. And everybody would be like, well, he questioned the king. And so this guy's gonna be real smooth here. He's gonna be real like under the radar. He's gonna be like, trying to tell David something without really telling him, you know? He's trying to be like really PC. He's gonna, he's gonna be really careful with how he says this. He says, oh yeah. You just imagine, oh, yeah, David, you know her. It's, it's Bathsheba, Bathsheba, you know. And then he starts to describe who she is. The daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. These names don't mean anything to us, but they meant something to David. Here's how we know, because in 2 Samuel chapter 23, we get a description of some important men in Israel. Some really, really important men. They're called David's mighty men. David's mighty men. These are like his personal bodyguard, his secret service, his, his special forces. These are the closest, most trusted soldiers in his army. These are the officers. These are the important dudes to David. He's been fighting with them for years, maybe since back when he was hiding in caves from King Saul. These are important people to him. Listed among those 37 men. You can, you can turn to it right now if you get bored with my sermon. Just go to chapter 23 and you just start looking at it. You'll see a name, Eliam. Eliam, one of his mighty men, one of his most important men. This was Bathsheba's daddy. What the guy is saying is, you know, one of your, one of your soul, like this is his daughter. Do, do, you know how much, do you know how much younger than you she is? She, you're 50. She's probably in her 20s, maybe probably 19, 20, 21. Like, this is, this is the little girl. This is one of your best friend's kids. Translation? Stop it, David. Just stop. Just stop. But it wasn't just who her daddy was. Because Eliam was the son of one of the most trusted, old, experienced advisors for King David. So Bathsheba's granddaddy was literally in the ear of David, telling him what to do in all situations. He had been there since the beginning. Most likely, because David had been king about 20 years, most likely David was around when she was born. Maybe she ran around, maybe she ran around like during feasts and during festivals, during celebrations when the, when the army would come home and they'd celebrate with their families. Maybe, maybe little Bathsheba was running around calling David, Uncle David. Maybe, maybe, she, maybe she set up on his lap and now, now this man's trying to say, you know who she is, right? Same little girl. Same little girl. You, you might want to tread lightly here. And then he goes on. Also, she is the wife, read, she's married. The wife of Uriah the Hittite. Not just, only, not just any guy. This is another one of the mighty men of Israel. David's mighty men. This is one of your most trusted soldiers, David. He's married to her. This brave servant is trying to get something through to David. He's trying to tell him to stop. And here's what happens when we are on the wrong path. We don't listen to the right people. We stop listening to the right people. And look at the next verse. It just shows, if you really read in between the lines and you take it slowly when you read the Bible, you'll find amazing things. Put yourself in the story and really think about what's going on. It says, then David sent messengers to get her messengers. Before he asked a messenger, now he's asking messengers. What's the translation here? He didn't like the answer that guy gave him, so he found somebody who wouldn't say anything. Let me say that again. He found somebody who wouldn't say no, who wouldn't point out who she was, and they just listened. They just went and got her. We don't listen to the right people. He sends these men to get her, and she came to him, and he slept with her. Here's the fourth thing that happens when, when we're struggling with sin, temptation, the hardest things that we deal with, the things that we feel like, I can't help it. We get too close. We get too close. He brought her into his bedroom. 
And then from there, it was all just downhill. There, there wasn't going to be a way back. He had allowed the situation to get out of hand. He had let her get too close. Here's what we know about temptations. It's difficult to be tempted by something you aren't close to. It's very difficult to be tempted by something you aren't close to. I'm going to do a little science experiment, a little science project, elementary school style. Here's a magnet. We'll let this represent sin, temptation. I'm going to bring up uh, one of our interns, our student ministry intern. Really love her. Her name is Rachel. Everybody say, hi, Rachel. Yeah. And so Rachel's going to help me with a little, little illustration. So she's got a little, um, a little Paw Patrol character, but we're going to call him King David uh, for the purposes of this, this, this illustration. So when David was far away from the sin and the temptation, he was fine. There was no struggle. This magnet cannot pull him in. He's too far away. But then David got complacent. He got just a little bit closer. He was in the wrong place, wrong time. Then he began to focus on the wrong thing. He gets a little bit closer. Focus on the wrong thing. He's focused on Bathsheba instead of God or instead of his wife or instead of his nation. He's focused on the wrong thing. Then he begins to stop listening to the right people. He takes another step forward. And then he calls some messengers in and says, hey, would you, would, you, would you bring her to me? Now he's too close. And just like that, he's stuck. And he may have felt like, he may have sat there and been in bed and thought, I can't believe this just happened. A few minutes ago, I was just laying in bed. I had a little sleep apnea. I couldn't sleep. And now I've just committed adultery with one of my friend's wives. How did this happen? It was a process. It was a process. It didn't happen all at once. That's what we like to say to ourselves to make ourselves feel better. Oh, you know, I, all of a sudden I was just in the worst moment of my life. I don't know how I got there. All of a sudden I was just addicted. All of a sudden I was just in this relationship. But it's not all of a sudden. It feels like it because we will get right to the edge of the temptation. And then we get sucked in. We're like, oh my gosh, it just, I couldn't do anything about it. I can't help it. No, you can't help it. You can't help it. But you've got to take steps way earlier than getting a couple of inches away from the temptation. Maybe you, you struggle with addiction. You struggle with addiction. Maybe, maybe it's alcohol. Well, if you go to a bar... If you hang out with the wrong people, you're getting too close. You struggle with lust. If you give yourself unfettered access to a computer with no boundaries, to, a, to, a, to an iPhone with no boundaries, and you're just sitting in your room at night, guess what? You're going to struggle with pornography. If you hang out with someone who is not your spouse, alone, behind closed doors, guess what? You're going to struggle with lust. It just is what it is. You're putting yourself too close to the situation. If you struggle with worry and anxiety and you constantly are on social media, arguing on Facebook, reading all the stories, watching the news, reading the blogs, guess what? You're going to worry. You're going to worry even more. You're going to be more anxious because you're putting yourself in the situation that draws you in. And all of a sudden, you're stuck. You're stuck. And you thought, how did I get here? You got there by following a process, by following a process, by not paying attention to where you were going, by not paying attention to who you weren't listening to, by focusing on the wrong thing, by getting too close. It didn't happen all at once. It was a process. It was a process. James, the, the half-brother of Jesus, he says this about, about temptation. James chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. He says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person, each person, each person, every person is tempted when they are dragged away by what? By Satan? By little demons with their pitchforks? By other people? It's everybody else's fault. Not my fault. Surely it's not my fault. What does James say? They're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. We put ourselves in those situations. We get too close. Ultimately, you tempt you, and I tempt me. We don't have anybody else to blame but ourselves. So often, we are the ones that put ourselves too close to the force that we couldn't control. And yes, you might not be able to control it if you'll get within one inch of it, but you can control whether or not you got within one inch of it to begin with. You can control that. We get 
too close. Let's return to the end of this story and see what ends up happening. Bathsheba, as happens often when you have sex, gets pregnant. She conceived and she sent word to David, I am pregnant. David's in trouble. This is no longer a one-night stand. This is no longer something he can brush beneath the rug. So he's trying to figure out, what, what do I do? How do I, how do I fix this? He lived in a day without DNA, without paternity tests, without Maury Povich show saying, you are not the father, you are the father. Like, nobody would know if he could just get Uriah to sleep with his wife. So he calls Uriah home. And Uriah comes home. And when Uriah comes to him, David's like trying all this smooth, small talk. Hey, Uriah, buddy pal. How's Joab? Oh, cool, yeah. Love Joab. He's a, he's a great guy. How, how, how are your friends? How's, how are the soldiers doing? How's, how's morale? Yeah. How's the war? Cool, cool, Uriah. Yeah, man. Hey, you know what you should do, Uriah, while you're here? Oh, man, I didn't think of this until now. You should go home. Why don't you go home and wash your feet? And we read this, and we're like, oh, wash your feet? That's a strange request. Here's what he's telling him. Go home, relax, and sleep with your wife. Enjoy yourself. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. The, the, the translation of this is like, it's like a food basket, like this, this gift basket is sent after him. It's like you go on your honeymoon, and, and like the day's in, sends like some cheap sausage and cheese and a pint of crappy wine after you and a little bit of lotion from Bath and Body Works. You're like, ah, oh, enjoy your honeymoon. You're like, oh, thanks, whatever. So he sends this little gift basket with Uriah. He's really going to get him in the mood. He's really going to get him to do what he wants him to do. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace and did not go to his house. David was told Uriah didn't go home, so he's like, oh, crap. Uriah, like, uh, like, what? didn't you just come from war? Why don't you go home? Uriah said to David, and here's a, another reminder of how far David has fallen. The ark in Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my commander Joab and my lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. We see a very, very, very important reminder here. The Ark of the Covenant, God's presence in Israel, is in a tent in the battlefield. And the king is in his palace, comfortable. This is not how things should be. But it's just another reminder that David has gotten complacent. He's focused on the wrong thing. He's in the wrong place. So David says to him, stay here one more day, and tomorrow I'll send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. David thinks, surely, I mean, we all do really, really stupid things when we get drunk. Surely he'll sleep with his wife. Let me just get him wasted, and the rest will take care of itself. But in the evening, even drunk, Uriah went to sleep on the mat. Among his serv master's servants, he did not go home. Even drunk, Uriah had more character than the king, than God's chosen one. In the morning, David writes a letter. I'm sure he thought, well, my hand's forced. Oh, I can't, can't believe I have to do this. Tough situation, man. But you know, I've got no choice. Oh, this is just the situation I'm in. No, 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 no. David, it's a situation you put yourself in. He sends a letter with Uriah, and in it he wrote, Put Uriah out in front where the fighting is the fiercest, then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. And when the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Died. I'm sure David didn't intend for this to happen. Not from the beginning. I'm sure he had better intentions. I'm sure he thought... It won't lead to this. But here's the thing about sin. Here's what we see in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Sinning always leads to more sin. Always. Always. We lie to ourselves. We rationalize. We think, oh, not this time. It won't be a big deal. But sinning always leads to more sin. You lie, you have to cover it up. You do something wrong, you have to cover it up. You get, you get selfish, you want to be selfish next time. You're prideful, you want to be prideful next time. You develop habits. One sin leads to another. Three of the biggest lies we tell ourselves are, it's just once, it's just one time, no big deal, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I'm forgiven, I'm going to heaven, 
blessed by the blood of Jesus. It'll be okay. It's just once, right? No, it's not just once. It's never just once. We don't know the gateways that open when we will do one thing that we shouldn't do. I've had some times where I think, oh, I'm okay, I'm okay, but then I do it one time, and it sucks me into the vortex of sin. It sucks me in because it's never just once. Another thing we tell ourselves, I just need to get it out of my system. Oh, I have been so in the word lately. You know, I've just been watching sermons nonstop, been listening to all the worship music. I am doing so well. I've been giving a lot of money to the church. I've been serving. I'm doing well. But you know, I got this itch, and I just need to scratch it. It's just once. I just need to get it out of my system. I deserve this, right? Like, I've been a good boy. I deserve a little hall pass from God. It's just once. Just once. I just need to get it out of my system. The third thing we lie to ourselves, say to ourselves, just this time, then I'll stop. Just this time. God, I'll make a deal with you. You let me mess up this one way, this one time, and let me get out of it with no consequences, and I'll serve you. I will go on a mission trip to the farthest place I can think of. I will give as much money as I can. Just give me this one time. And then I'll stop. Sinning leads to more sin. Always. Always. Started with adultery. It ended in murder. Skip forward to verse 26 at the end of chapter 11. It says, when Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. And I'm sure David found himself thinking, how did I get here? How on earth did I end up a murderer? I thought I was better. I, I'm a king. I'm a, I'm a good Jewish Israelite man. I make the proper sacrifices. I know God. I wrote the Psalms. I'm important. How did I end up a murderer? It's a process. It's a process. It doesn't happen all at once. And then when we mess up, we end up asking, how on earth did I get here? Because we don't mean to. We, we didn't want, no one wakes up one day thinking, I want to ruin my life. I want to end my marriage. I want my kids to hate me. I want to end in financial ruin. I want to be addicted. Nobody wants that. But it's a process. We take one small step at a time. One small step at a time, and we end up in a place we never thought we would have been. And here's where God comes in. God loves us so much that he does not want us to end up in a jail, jail cell created by ourselves. He doesn't want us to end up trapped in a trap that we put ourselves in. He doesn't want us to take the bait. He doesn't want us to end up in these places. God knows something that we also know. We've got enough problems as it is. You are going to be negatively affected by the government, by your leaders, by your spouse, by your kids, by your friends, by a virus, by the economy. That stuff's going to happen whether you live a perfect life or not. So what God, what God wants for you as loved children is to avoid the things that you can avoid. It's for me to avoid the things I can avoid because let's be honest, Let's be honest. I know we love to blame other people. What was their fault? Well, I can't, I can't believe they did that. I'm great at it. I'm so good at rationalizing, so good at, at, at blaming other people. You can ask my wife. I do it all the time. Well, if he had it, well, she had Well, you know, well, uh, 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 blah, 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 blah. And it's just blaming other people. We, we know the truth. Most issues in our lives are our faults. You said the wrong thing. You did the wrong thing. You went to the wrong place. You sent the wrong text message. You watched the wrong video or image. You smoke or drank the wrong thing. You made decisions over and over and over again. You gave into your pride. You gave into your ego. You gave into your selfishness. You gave into gossip. You gave into whatever you felt like at the moment. And you put yourself in a world of trouble. But God doesn't want that for you. God doesn't want it for me. And so he gives us wisdom. He gives us a way out, as Paul says it. A way out so that we don't have to experience the things that we can control. God wants what's best for you. And following him is what gets us there. So here's my encouragement to you. Whether you're a Jesus follower or maybe you're not, maybe you're not, here's my encouragement to you. Learn from David. 
Learn from his example. You don't have to go through what you might go through. You could learn from his mistakes. Follow God's wisdom. Look for the way out, not the way in. Look for the way out of the sin, not the way in. I mean, there have been times where like, like I remember when I was living alone and, and there, were, there were struggles with pornography and I would walk past and I would see my Bible on the, I remember, I just have it in my mind's eye. You know how you, those, those things in your eye, in your mind's eye? And I, and I saw this, my Bible just sitting on a table on the way into my room. And it was a way out. It was a way out. And I remember distinctly this, this one particular time years ago saying, eh, no, I'm gonna go do what I wanna do. God offers us a way out if we'll take it. And we've got to ask for his power. We're not meant to do this alone. If you're a Jesus follower, you have the Holy Spirit in you. The blood of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus is within you, able to conquer all sin, all struggles, all temptations, all habits, if you'll take it. And even if you're not a Jesus follower, you have that power available to you if you'll ask, if you'll just try it out. There's a verse in the Old Testament that says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You know what tasting and seeing is? It's listening, it's trying, it's obeying and seeing what happens. I dare you, if you don't follow Jesus, I dare you to take one month to follow him in one area of your life and see what happens. See how you're blessed. Not because he gives you things to reward you, but because his way is better than our way. Try it. What do you have to lose? So many people have come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior by simply taking the step of saying, I'll listen to him before I believe in him. And I'll see if what he says is true. And they find it's true, and it's better than they thought, and it's better than they could imagine. And so they say, I'll, I'll give it all to you then. I'll give it all to you. That's my challenge to you. If you're, if you're, if you're concerned and, and not sure what you believe, just try something. Try to live it out for a moment, for a week, for a month. See what happens. And ask yourself these questions. Maybe you've had this, you've had it in your mind probably the entire time I've been talking. Probably since I said I can't help it, something came to your mind of that thing you can't help. Ask yourself the questions, are there, are, are there areas where I'm getting complacent, where I've kind of let my guard down, where I think, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll be fine? Are there places where you're focusing on the wrong thing? You've lost your focus on God or, or on the important things in your life, what God's called you to, and you're just, you're, you're paying attention to just these distractions? Are there some people in your life that you're not listening to anymore? Well, I got out of that life group. Psh, they told me things I didn't like. I can't believe it. I can't believe they would say that to me. Perhaps they were right. Perhaps they were trying to help. And you didn't like it. But if you would just listen, you'd be in a better place. Maybe you need to get back in that life group. Maybe you need to go back to that accountability partner or that mentor, that person that, that maybe you pulled away from because you're like, I don't like what they're saying. But you need to start letting those people into your life because you've, you've pushed them away for too long and you've paid the price. Maybe you need to ask yourself, are there places where I'm too close? That, that might be the most applicable one because it's just so obvious. Are we getting too close? Are we getting too relaxed? Ask yourself those questions. Here's how we're gonna respond tonight or today. I wanna, um, I wanna give you the opportunity to respond physically to this, whether you're in this room or whether you're online in your living room, in your kitchen, at a coffee shop. And I believe there's something important that happens when we respond physically. Um, it doesn't make us better people or better Christians or God love us more. It's just something like, it's just like writing something down. It helps you remember it. Sometimes when you take a physical step, it helps you remember it. And uh, I'm just gonna ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes. This is not a salvation invitation. This is an invitation for anyone in this room who's struggling with something, anyone online who's struggling with something. The whole time you've been thinking about it, I'm getting too close. Or maybe you already got there and you're, you're paying the price, but maybe you're still at the beginning and you're like, ah, yeah, there's probably a couple little areas I need to clean up. If that's you, on the count of three, whether, wherever you are, either in room or online, I wanna in invite you to just stand up and I wanna pray for you. And you may be like, oh, I don't want people to think I'm, I'm bad. We're, we're all bad. We're all messed up. If you, if you really wanna kind of not see what people are, see that people are looking at you or whatever, just close your eyes. Pretend you're like an ostrich. Bury your head in the sand and just pretend like nobody sees you. Just close your eyes, stand up, and then sit back down. You won't even know what was going on around you. On the count of three, I wanna invite you to stand up. One, two, three. If you're on online or in the room, just stand up and I wanna see who I'm praying for. I'm standing up myself. I know there's so many times where I lie to myself and I do things I'm not supposed to do and I go in directions I'm not supposed to go down. I rationalize, I rationalize, I rationalize. If that's you, just stand up. Let's pray 
a prayer together. Let me pray a prayer over you. Heavenly Father, I pray for each person standing in this room that I can see and each person standing online that I cannot see. But you can see them. Lord, wherever they are, whoever they're with, I thank you for their boldness and their courage to stand up and say, yeah, that's me. Maybe I'm going down a path that I shouldn't be going down. And I want to get off that path. Lord, I pray for your wisdom to wash over every single person that they would listen to your ways, that they would ask themselves the questions, that they would journal about it, that they would think about it, that they would pray about it, and that you would help them by your power and your wisdom to get off that path, to avoid the worst day of their life, to avoid hurting themselves and the people around them. Lord, I pray that we would all know it's a process. It's a process. We don't mess up all at once. We don't ruin our lives all at once. We intend a lot of things, but we've got to actually go in the direction of the places we want to go. Lord, help us find a way out. I pray that each person in this room, each person online would find the way out today, this week. As they approach those problem areas that they would see the way out. Feel the, feel the kind of the, the glimpse of the Holy Spirit. See the Bible, see the text from a friend. See the, the, the app that sends them some Bible verse or something just in the nick of time. And it seems like a coincidence, but it's not. It's a way out. It's a way out. Lord, I pray we pay attention to the ways out and that we'd be better for it. And we will be better for it because you love us so much. You're a loving, heavenly Father. We love you, Lord. We thank you for loving us. In your name I pray, amen. Everybody else, let's stand together. We wanna close in a time of worship, worshiping the God, the God who loves us, the God who wants what's best for us, the God who has given it all for us. So let's sing to him.